a third of you have uh, procedures in place for cross-border cooperation, a third don't, and a third don't know. Uh, and most of you haven't dealt with a cross-border case of a child trafficking or a disappearance. Uh, that's good to know. Uh, then we know how, how to frame as well this workshop. Uh, why we are talking about cross-border cross cooperation today? Uh, first of all, because it's a priority for both our organization, uh, from Expat UK and from Mission Children Europe. And why is it a priority? Uh, because we believe that better cross-border cooperation between member states and the European Union can really better prevent and respond to disappearances of children in migration uh, and also for trafficking of children in migration because both are very much interlinked. Uh, however, what we see is that in practice, uh, there is a lot of gaps in cross-border cooperation which might be linked to uh, well, a lack of uh, legal, uh, uh, legal structure, a lack of policies at the member state level and at the EU level. Uh, a lack of procedures, uh, like such as standard pro uh, operating procedures, for example, or pro like protocols of cooperation between uh, different agencies, such as law enforcement, child protection. Uh, in general, well, Loha will talk a bit more about that, but structural and legal gaps. But it's also linked to gaps in uh, the way we, uh, information is shared uh, and gaps in protection uh, of the data of children migration that are shared in these cases. Um, and so we will go a bit more details about that. Uh, in terms of number, uh, just to give an extent of the issue of children that go missing and children who were trafficked uh, in, at the European level, uh, in between 2014 and 2017, we had, it's estimate, estimated that 30,000 children went missing. However, because data is not like, collected in a consistent way uh, and, not, and reporting rarely happens of children migration going missing, the exact number is actually expected to be much higher. Uh, and there is an increasing link between children going missing and children being trafficked. Uh, Europol stated in the last report in 2018 uh, that indeed children in migration are at higher risk of trafficking and that it's expected that this number even decrease uh, in the future. Uh, just uh, as an example, in the UK, one in six unaccompanied and trafficked children went missing. So there is a, a big crossover and we really believe that it's now uh, the time to take a take a stand and to really step up cross border cooperation uh, to better prevent and to better protect children migration. So this webinar is based on uh, a policy paper that we have developed jointly with Expat UK, um, and of course with the support of the Initiative for Children and Migration that I just mentioned, uh, but also partners in a project that we are both involved in that really specifically uh, looks at this issue uh, on a more practical level, and maybe we have a chance to talk about it more later. Uh, a bit more later in the in the webinar. Uh, so how uh, the webinar is going to be structured? So uh, it's going to be structured alongside the um, policy paper. Uh, we're first going to look at why cross-border cooperation is important and needed. Uh, what are the current gaps? Uh, what exists already? Uh, and what we are calling uh, for? So what can be done? What are the next steps? Uh, maybe I'm going to start uh, with the why cross-border cooperation is needed and important. Uh, of course, I already <laughs> kind of introduced the subject, but for different reasons. The first one is for family reunification. So children in migration go missing and eventually is often at risk of trafficking for different reasons. Uh, and one of the main reasons is the lack of uh, fast and efficient, cross uh, lack, of, la lack of clear and efficient uh, procedures to apply for asylum, but also to be recognized as a victim uh, of trafficking or to be reunited with their families. Because of these long procedures, children sometimes often feel discouraged uh, and they may want to try to find other ways uh, to move to, to, the, to another country where their family members are. Uh, but also because of this lack of uh, fast procedures, they are often left well, without a parent caring for them, uh, which is also linked to another issue, which is the guardian. Uh, guardian, guardians that are not appointed in all EU member states, or when they are appointed, not in sufficient numbers, uh, not with the sufficient quality, uh, and yeah, sometimes not quickly enough for the child to actually uh, be able to build trust with someone uh, that is caring for them. Uh, the Dublin regulation is the regulation that establishes uh, the method of how uh, which member state is responsible to actually receive an asylum application but also the regulation that establishes the duty for member states to look in priority uh, for family members of a child who is applying for asylum. So these cases 
uh, unaccompanied minor should be treated with priority uh, and their best interest should always be taken into account in deciding whether uh, they have or they have a right to family unification of course obviously uh, but to decide whether this child should be reunified with their family so these cases should be treated with priority uh, and what we see in the practice is that it's not always the case uh, that these procedures are long uh, for different reasons that may be linked uh, to human resources, for example, also just to structural gaps and the fact that the systems are not set up in the same way in all countries. Mm, but the result of that uh, is that it leaves indeed children uh, out of the protection system uh, and leaves them to take ways, uh, that more dangerous ways, and to be more prone to exploitation, trafficking, and disappearance activities. So it is very much needed to make step up uh, family reunification cases, reunification under Dublin. Um, another uh, another point of why cross border cooperation is uh, is important, it's very much linked, is for children who don't have a family member in another EU country. Uh, for these children, you also need to provide safe and legal routes. Uh, if you don't, the same issues that we just mentioned appear, and they might go missing. They might fall prey to exploitation and trafficking. Uh, so this is very much needed. A few initiatives have taken place in that sense. For example, in the UK, uh, you have the DEPS Amendment, which is a scheme that took place a few years ago, 2017-16, uh, and that basically allows, uh, well, obliges the UK to uh, take children who are at risk of trafficking, who are at risk of exploitation in France, Italy, and Greece to the UK. However, this system is currently at risk uh, with Brexit and other issues uh, in Italy at the moment. Another uh, another point of why uh, cross-border cooperation is needed and important is, of course, uh, to respond to disappearances of children in migration uh, and to respond to uh, trafficked children uh, for different reasons. So we mentioned a few reasons why children go missing. Uh, they also go missing because there's a lack of information, there is a lack of uh, reception conditions, uh, and there is uh, often also uh, a lack of information, yeah, about their rights and the risk of trafficking. So how could cross-border cooperation uh, better prevent and respond to these cases? Very simply, for prevention of uh, disappearance and exploitation of children migration is information sharing. Uh, if you have information about a child uh, that has gone missing from the country and you're likely to know that this child is going or has been taken to another country, uh, you might proactively share information with that country and speed up uh, the, the identification, the registration process of, uh, of the child. In doing so, uh, you speed up the procedures and you make sure that the child is directly uh, in the protection system and doesn't fall out. In terms of the response, uh, it's also very much needed when a child, uh, when a child goes missing or is at risk of trafficking, uh, be just simply, for example, for a country to close the case. So again, if, if, a, if a child has gone to another country uh, and there is no cross-border cooperation, you're not able to close the case and it's a little bit better. So it's very com much counterproductive, but it's also very much harmful for the child because it means that it, if there is no cross-border cooperation, if there is no information sharing, uh, it means that the child has to go through multiple processes in all different countries, uh, meaning multiple interviews, meaning multiple uh, perhaps photo taken, fingerprints taken, uh, all that could be prevented if there is better information sharing. Um, and then it leads to my other point, which is the continuation of a care plan. So once a child has been identified and has been registered, uh, there is uh, usually what uh, practitioners would do is to establish a care plan with the child. Uh, by sharing information with different countries as well, uh, that will allow you to enrich the care plan and to make sure that the care plan is not disrupted and you don't go into multiple processes. So that is a nutshell why cross-border cooperation is needed. Uh, and I would leave the floor to Laura just to tell you a bit more about uh, what are the current gaps in cross-border cooperation. Hello, everybody. Um, so thank you so much, Laura, for that introduction. Um, we're going to be looking at then some of the gaps and the barriers in some of the procedures that Lore just identified. So, um, for example, within obviously 
Laura identified some of the really significant issues in separated children being able to access um, transfers through Dublin 3. Um, <clears throat> that will create really long delays for children and young people living them in very precarious situation in inadequate accumulation and possibly very vulnerable to exploitation be that because they want to undertake uh, their own migration in unsafe ways or be that because they are um, in such dire conditions that they're just very very vulnerable to being groomed in in any sort of way in various member states um regarding <coughs> my apologies i just coughed into the microphone um, regarding the procedures between member states, obviously, um, these, you know, these legal gaps um, are often uh, the issue that is often raised by professionals as to why there are such significant gaps between sharing information uh, amongst professionals with the view of protecting children is that there is no firewall in place to ensure that any information that is shared um, regarding protection, regarding safeguarding children, is not then used further in ways that can be harmful for the child. So many professionals in many member states report that they feel very uncomfortable about the sharing of information <clears throat> because that information can be used, for example, in the context of immigration enforcement, or it can be used in the context of criminal justice measures. And unfortunately, this is a very significant gap because um, it is well known within the sector of child protection that the lack of information sharing can often be a very significant issue hindering the correct responses to make sure that children are safeguarded. Um, but it is very difficult to be able to freely change share that information with other professionals as needed when there is no clear understanding between various agencies that that sharing of information will not then be harmful for the child. In the context of the UK, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, for example, our legal framework around the Data Protection Act has an explicit um, exemption around data sharing for the purposes of immigration control. So even, for example, in the guise of the European system under the General Data Protection Regulation, there's still all these examples in various member states where data is being shared between agencies for um, not in the best interest of children as a primary consideration, but in the interest of um, immigration enforcement or in the child's asylum claim, for example. Um, so this translates well into what is the often existing procedure to share information uh, regarding uh, children going missing. So we have the second generation Schengen information system, or you all might know it as SIS2, which is the database of live alerts of individuals and objects that are um, of interest to law enforcement. So quite often this is used in, for example, cases of other missing children to alert other member states that, that the child might, for example, currently be in that country and to be alert. Um, but unfortunately, the use of CIS-2 can sometimes um, be counterproductive for children um, who are missing, who are children in migration, um, due to the fact that um, these firewalls are not in place and that, um, you know, managing the, the return of the child might, for example, put the child at risk because really it is not um, in their best interest, let's say, to be returned to the country that issued the alert. Um, so that's just one example of, of where this gap around information sharing really needs to be addressed. Then guardianship is a uh, just time and time again been proven to be a really significant factor influencing uh, both the identification and the long-term out, long outcomes for children in migration. 
So various different member states have different models of guardianship, but unfortunately some of those models are very inconsistent. Uh, some of the guardians have, for example, too many uh, cases of children that they are representing so they don't get to meet the child face to face, meaning that children are lagging in procedures before ever meeting their guardian. Um, so a key measure is to ensure that you know all unaccompanied children and all trafficked children have a guardian who is qualified, trained, and appointed swiftly, and that the role of the guardian is very clear. Then professionals uh, across the board um, consistently uh, lack training in all the various areas that we have talked about, be that in their ability to identify children who are currently being exploited, in their ability to safeguard just children in migration generally from um, falling into exploitation, and then ensuring that all the procedures are in place to swiftly uh, do the best possible um, that, that the best possible procedures are in place to ensure that children's cases are going well, that their um, that their claims are being sorted, and that as they're approaching eighteen, they transition to adulthood into uh, more stable futures. So this brings us to then the 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 final and I would say one of the most pressing gaps that uh, we identified and is that currently no member state has directly transposed their duties of the EU trafficking directive which talks about the need for member states to identify a durable solution for child victims of trafficking. This will leave any child that even after identified um, as having been exploited, often with uh, limited options as to long-term outcomes and the long-term support, it might leave them at the point in which, as they're turning 18 years old, a lot of the protection that they had will fade. No real solution has been identified for him for them, very often they will remain in immigration limbo or with a lot of other pressing issues. Um, and for example, many of them might be facing uh, return procedures back to their countries of origin where they will be very unsafe. So this is really a very significant gap that is really prevalent in all member states. Um, so what is currently out there? So there are quite a few um, informal and formal initiatives that we can cite that you know frontline professionals can seek to access now but unfortunately a lot of those um, different procedures are um, you know the formal procedures really focus heavily on uh, post-identification of children as trafficking victims and predominantly in the investigation of trafficking offenses, which is absolutely welcome. Um, but what we would seek is that there would be more formal networks and formal procedures to prevent children from being exploited in the first place and to ensure that children in migration can access the support that they need. So some of these, for example, the NSPCC, which is the National Society uh, to prevent the cruelty of children has a child trafficking advice center and they have a, um, a, a project which was working with refugee youth service in order to <clears throat> identify children that were um, in France who were undertaking the journey to come to the UK clandestinely to ensure that they were um, safeguarded once they arrived. Some of the other projects, for example, is the transnational referral mechanism, which is <clears throat> a referral mechanism for victims of trafficking that works transnationally across a few different member states. That's with Hungary, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And this is a project led by IOM, um, which can be a sort of good model to look at 
um, when we're looking at how different organizations and professionals can build a trusted relationship formally. But unfortunately, we have to emphasize that a firewall must be in place when um, this information is shared to ensure that um, you know, information is used as a way to safeguard and not as a means of immigration enforcement. Um, obviously, under the Dublin procedures, there's a Eurodoc database, um, which again is used mostly to enforce, um, you know, the member state that uh, under Dublin has the duty to process asylum claims. And within the law enforcement network, we have Europol and Eurojust, who often do uh, joint investigation teams or JITs, and they will receive a lot of support from Europol and Eurojust in order to facilitate law enforcement operations in various member states and sometimes in third countries um, in order to disrupt um, and prosecute um, networks of uh, human trafficking. We also have the 1600 hotlines for missing children, which Missing Children Europe coordinates. Um, and this is a fantastic resource to access for all professionals working out there. <coughs> Particularly if, for example, it's known to you that the child had a particular intention to go to a different country. This is a great way to coordinate ensuring, for example, that the child is then known to um, uh, you know, protection in the country that they arrive to, that um, we can ensure that they have arrived safely and that they are, um, again, known to um, different child protection agencies. <clears throat> My apologies. There's other um, networks around also uh, human trafficking, such as, uh, and this is more of, with the view of prosecuting um, trafficking offenses. And these are, for example, the European Criminal Records Information System, uh, which is a way for EU member states to exchange information on convictions. And then there's uh, Prune Decisions, which is a national, a nation a national database that has DNA samples and other biometric information um, that EU member states can access. Um, and now I'm going to pass over to Lore. Um, so on to you, Lore. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, thank you very much. Well, maybe uh, I wanted to, yeah, to, to stress uh, Stress again the gap that you just mentioned because uh, the, the gaps that we identified are based on researchers uh, like research that is available uh, that is available at the moment, but also on practice. Uh, Expat UK and ourselves uh, are involved in the projects at the moment that we lead, which is called the Amina project, uh, and it's really focusing on cross border cooperation. Uh, and what is striking is that the cross border gap that you just mentioned we actually also experienced it in the same project. So the project is very practical. So basically uh, what we try to do is to uh, work on, say, in six countries, around 250 cases of children who went missing in migration for reasons linked to trafficking. Uh, so one child went missing in three countries and one child went missing in three other countries. Uh, with like a story, with briefings, we gathered in each of these six countries uh, professionals that usually work on these issues around the table. Uh, and so it's like a trade on guardian, like reception centers, law enforcement, the hotline, uh, child protection authorities, immigration authorities. We brought them all together. In each country, they had to work on the case together, but also across border. Uh, and one of the uh, well, one of the main striking uh, observation, of course, is that cross border cooperation didn't happen uh, because of all the gaps mentioned, lack of information sharing, trust uh, building across border as well. Uh, lack of queue procedures, who does what, who has the responsibility to, to do what and to contact who, uh, that's not very clear. Uh, so all the guests have mentioned, we actually really saw them again in this project. Um, voilà, let's just, just move on. Um, what, I, yeah, what I also wanted to say is that there are gaps, uh, there are, there are uh, improvements. However, uh, as Laura already mentioned, they are very much focused on law enforcement uh, procedures and joint investigation. So um, we've seen that joint, joint investigation on uh, child victims of trafficking, well, on trafficking issues involving children are really on the rise. 
uh, slowly, but getting there. But uh, when it comes to the protection of the child, there is a clear gap for the population. Uh, so what we're going to do now is to move to the next point, which is the key steps. So what are we? What are the options that we could push for uh, at the national level, but also at the European level? This is based uh, well on the observation we made as part of a project on the research that the policy paper is based on, but also on different different conferences that we held, different points participatory, and where participants could actually come with their own recommendations. Uh, the first key step for us would indeed to uh, have this firewall in place between child protection authorities, between immigration authorities, between uh, the different actors that work with the child, being the hotline, being the reception center, the guardian, when handling data of children in migration. Uh, meaning, for example, by having uh, access limitation uh, to such data uh, when it is in the best interest of the child, uh, but also, if not possible, to build other tools uh, that don't exist at the moment because we have this firewall in place. Uh, for example, Laura mentioned the SIS system. Yeah, it's, it's, it could be a potential amazing tool to find children in migration that go missing uh, and are at risk of trafficking, but because of this lack of firewall, uh, well, people like the professionals are often constraining themselves to use it. Uh, and that is the thing. So if this is not possible to have, this file in place by having clear, a clear limitation to access to be building new tools. Um, on that, there is a new uh, EU regulation on the interoperability of informatic, system, informatic systems, uh, which actually aims at bridging the lack of uh, well, the lack of coordination between all the different European systems. Basically, being the Eurodac, for example, being all the LISA uh, information system, being the SIS that uh, Laura mentioned. Um, so we welcome the fact that there is cooperation and that it would it might potentially lead to better data, uh, avoiding you know double counting for example, avoiding uh, mistakes in collecting data. Uh, what we will need to be careful about in the future is that this uh, regulation doesn't put children at risk because there is no firewall, uh, and this is something that we will also investigate in the future. The second step uh, would be to have better data collection and exchange, of course, on missing and trafficked children in a harmonized and systematic way. Uh, for different reasons, uh, the first reason is that, well, to have a better understanding of the scale of the issue, uh, which would lead to a better response and better aware awareness raising of the issue, but also for professionals to have a better understanding and to have a better view on who they are working with. Uh, that is uh, our second key step. A third key step would be that all unaccompanied children are appointed a qualified, trained, and independent guardian as soon as they're identified. Uh, as Laura mentioned, this is uh, currently lacking in some member states. Uh, when the children are appointed a guardian, uh, which is qualified, trained, and independent, sometimes it is appointed a guardian too late. And that's actually also something that we saw in the practice with the project I just mentioned before. Uh, or it might also be the case that uh, Guardians have too many children to, to deal with, and they don't have the time to actually spend the time they would need to uh, ensure the well being and the best interest of the child and take the time to build trust. Uh, so, this is something that we really call for. Uh, a network that could be useful is the European Network for Guardianship. Uh, that is uh, a project which is led by NIDA, the Dutch Guardianship uh, System for Unaccompanied Minors, in 2017, and it has the potential. To above the fact that it aims to uh, share best practices and being kind of a support network for guardians and guardianship institution, it really has the potential uh, for cross-border cooperation because we really believe it's a great pre prevention measure. And when we ask practitioners, uh, for example, who would you share information with? Who is the first contact point in case of a disappearance or in case of yeah, a disappearance linked to an element of trafficking? Uh, most of the time, it's the guardian because it's the person who is most close to the child. So that's something that we really call for uh, as well. Uh, we also, uh, as a next step, uh, ideally, the, the system that would replace the Dublin, the current Dublin system, uh, and that is due to happen in the next years, we believe, uh, or years, <laughs> depending how the EU is uh, reforming the common European asylum system. Uh, so we really hope that the new Dublin system will really maintain the best interest of the child and maintain the principle that if a child doesn't have a family member in another member state, that the child is allowed to stay in that member state. That is very crucial as well. Uh, again, we really hope and we will push for that 
that the, you could uh, upcoming new common European asylum system uh, that policymakers take that opportunity actually. Uh, on specifically on the common European asylum system, there is uh, a policy paper that has been developed as well and a webinar and that is available on the website which is uh, if you're interested. Uh, another key step uh, is to ensure a continuum of care uh, and non-discriminatory care and protection along the journey. Uh, for example, by making sure that all child protection and international protection standards that are available at the EU level are equally transposed at the national level. Uh, and the sixth key step for us would be to support children to move safely from one country to another. As we say, some children may have family members in another country, some children may not have uh, family members. But we think it's really crucial. That can be done in different ways. For example, from refraining from applying the Dublin transfer back to the first country uh, and by maintaining the principle that we just mentioned, that the child can stay in the, the member state that they are if they don't have a family member in another member state. Secondly, it could be done by having a new efficient Dublin system, as mentioned already. Uh, also, a strong solidarity mechanism on the blueprint of the relocation system that took place uh, in Italy and Greece a few years ago. It could also be done by increasing the quotas for resettlement, but actually also implement uh, the quotas of resettlement, uh, which is clearly lacking at the moment. Uh, and finally, it could also be done by creating more possibilities for children to move across borders. So this reasons being education work, community reunification in general. Uh, and I'll leave the floor to Laura to present you what are on the next suggested steps as well. If Great. If you have any questions, please let us know. Sorry. So the cross-border case management service and information sharing um, so as we said, this would be an essential implementation following having a firewall in place between um, the different agencies. But essentially what this would mean is that, for example, if a child or young person is first uh, coming into contact in one particular member state and they have gone through an interview, they have met with their social worker there, um, they have already um, um, you know, given a lot of details, they this could prevent um, you know professionals being able to share that information and making sure that the care plan takes into account the work that other professionals have done in the past without the need to re-traumatize young people, re-traumatize, uh, ask again the same questions. Um, and go over the same histories and the same information over and over again. So this could be a really effective tool also in order to ensure that once a child is identified that um, the different agencies can immediately put in place um, a really robust risk assessment if they have to take into account considerations that, for example, the young person was in a situation of trafficking before um, and what would be what would safe accumulation look like for that young person if they have been, um, you know, in other types, if, if they have other types of vulnerabilities, what are the things that practitioners need to take into account when they're considering risk? regarding placement, regarding their planning, regarding education. So this would really be essential. Um, also, formalizing the cooperation nationally and you know, cross-border. Um, it was very interesting when we were doing the AMINA project to understand that very often, obviously, cross-border cooperation between member states can often be just non-existent, but even within um, one member state, there can be so many challenges just across different counties and municipalities with regards to, for example, cases of children going missing that are known to have gone missing in one area, but there's information that there might be in another area or um, these sorts of things. So we would really we would really emphasize that these types of agreements of cooperation are formalized and don't necessarily rely on the fact that, um, you know, you met somebody at a conference, so you know who to call, but that everybody can have access to really uh, protecting a child in those types of cases in a formal basis. Um, then 
the ninth key step would be to support access to funding for um, civil society organizations that are, um, you know, providing these essential services to children. <clears throat> Excuse me. As well as to you know, develop and raise awareness on the tools that are out there that we could emphasize, like um, Laura mentioned the use of CIS2. Um, if a firewall were in place, it could, this could be a really great tool to access or emphasizing the European Guardianship Network or um, making sure that there's the standard operating procedures between organizations. Right, so back to you, Laura. Um, yes, well, I don't have much to add, uh, just letting uh, the participants know that the policy paper is being finalized and we will share it with you as soon as it is, uh, and that if you, uh, if you want, you can co-sign it, uh, and then we will defend it accordingly and feel free to use it in your uh, advocacy efforts, being at the national level or at the European level. Uh, and now we have, I think, 15 minutes for questions, so please go ahead. I hope you could hear me well because I see a comment that says that please increase the volume. So I hope you heard me well. Still not, maybe. Can everybody hear me? Uh oh. Okay. So, okay, so some people can hear, some people not so much. Uh, so just to, to repeat, but I just have to make sure that everyone got the message is that the policy paper is being finalized. Uh, so the policy paper, which is at the basis of this webinar, uh, and that if you want, we'll share it with you. If you want to co-sign it, please feel free. And we also encourage you to use it in your advocacy for the national or European uh, level. Uh, and now we have 15 minutes for questions. So please go ahead. I think I've lost sound. Uh oh. Okay, I see a comment that says that, yeah, it would be good to have a copy of the policy paper. We'll share it for sure. Does anybody have any questions? So it's in the chat box. Um... Oh, great. Emma, I think you do have a question. You're typing it out. <laughs> I recognize some names here. waiting for Emma's question. This is plenty of time. <laughs> and I think some of you are uh, practitioners working directly with children and young people. So we're also happy to answer some more practice based questions. If if you have those, obviously we'll do our best to to try to answer. If you also want to sh like share uh, a few initiatives or efforts that you're working on at cross border level and that work well, please feel free. We'll be happy to hear from it. Oh, great! So Lila is a practitioner, and that would be useful to answer some more practice-based questions. So Emma asks, sorry, as I think I missed some info on your methodology. I was wondering what responses you had during the project from statutory agencies on the recommendation for a firewall. Was their understanding of the longer term benefits of this in terms of prevention, identification and outcomes? 
Oh, that's a, that's a really good question, Emma. Um, so we haven't had the input yet from the statutory agencies on that particular recommendation. Um, I don't know if you have, Laura, in Belgium had uh, a response on the Amina project about what the different statutory agencies think on a firewall? No, we have not. Uh, what I can share, though, is the input we've got from the project itself uh, and the views of the practitioners that were working on it in the six different countries. And I think there were kind of an agreement on the fact that that was very much needed. In terms of the longer term benefits, I think it would be good to investigate about that for sure. Uh, but in general, people were quite positive. The goal is really to have the best interest of the child into, into consideration uh, and to make sure that information that is shared is shared with trustworthy individuals and organizations uh, with the best interest of the child in mind for its own protection and are not used for immigration enforcement. Um, there, are, there may be different ways of doing so, but we're calling for us to make sure that there are ways to start with uh, and then that they are harmonized. Uh, we know that some, uh, some of the countries that we work with for the project, for example, had different practices in terms of sharing information within the country. Uh, they had different practices in terms of you know, securing the information that was shared, being with like encrypted technology, for example. So that's something that we could look into as well. Uh, so yeah, it's a very good question that we, we will investigate on. Yeah, I think that from from the point of view, Emma, um, just here in the UK nationally, um, our uh, partner, our institutional partner was the Modern Slavery Unit. And, you know, just within that unit, I think they were uh, really open to, you know, having this type of uh, firewall in place. But I think that within the context of the legal framework uh, here, it, it would be very, very challenging to be able to achieve that just uh, at a government level but regardless it is absolutely what we would recommend as essential to be in place in order to ensure that uh, children are safeguarded and that the information is not being used for other purposes for example in any of their immigration claims and that sort of thing and again on this right so sorry. oh sorry go on this particular issue i mentioned the new regulation at the european level so it comes from uh, there is a new regulation that makes bridges, like connects the different informatic systems used by the EU. Um, and we will consult with the European Commission in the next week uh, to discuss what firewall can be in place for that. Uh, so we'll have more information on that as well. Like what is the view of the European Commission on this particular, uh, on, on this new measure, basically, uh, and how to make sure that the firewall is in place. So we'll come back to you on that. So Leila has a question. My organization is a first responder for the NRM in the UK. Are there any key points for us to emphasize in our interactions when liaising with the NRM? Uh, so, so Leila, I think that when you're acting in the role of a first responder and you're providing um, information to the single competent authority, um, obviously, um, you know, with regards to information sharing, I think it is absolutely essential that, you know, you are able to obviously provide the fullest picture of the information that you have, and if at all possible, conduct a multi-agency, <clears throat> um, you know, a strategy meeting with various partners, because, you know, it could be that, for example, other partners around the table might also have information that is relevant in the context of a referral to the NRM. But I think it is also really important to be mindful that um, the single competent authority as it sits within the home office is going to be sharing information with other um, different um, uh, departments within the home office. Um, that, for example, it could be that the information is shared with UK visas and immigration and that if the information is not consistent, for example, what you're putting in there as a first responder 
maybe it wasn't verified, maybe there was a, an interpreter that didn't uh, interpret correctly, um, maybe the young person was uh, saying a story that was coached, and unfortunately we just time and time again see these types of cases when those inconsistencies can be used against the, the child or young person in the context of their uh, immigration application, for example, if they uh, make adverse credibility findings against them or all sorts of other types of issues. So I think, you know, before that firewall is in place and we can ensure that that's the case, it is absolutely essential that whenever you're putting that information through that if at all appropriate, you verify with the young person and that you liaise with any of the legal representatives that a young person might have, be that their immigration solicitor or their criminal solicitor or their community care public law solicitor. So I hope that answers your question, Leila. There is another um, question from Tian. Sorry if I misheard it. <laughs> Transferring and handing over uh, of children for rehabilitation is always difficult when there is the issue of cross border. Uh, how the standard of operation procedures between the countries can help? NGO network support, but in the absence of government support, it becomes very difficult. What can we do in this regard? Uh, well, I first of all very much agree with you. <laughs> is that the NGO networks I think are very useful. Uh, to cover the gap, but that this issue must be taken up by the government. Uh, of course, in a multi-agency setting, so not totally by the government, but I think, I, I do believe uh, that, the, that the government should take up the issue and, and take responsibility for that with the support of the NGO. Uh, and how the standard, of, of, uh, the standard operating procedures could help, uh, it could be in different forms, but the real goal of the standard operating procedures is to say, in this specific case, the standard operating procedure involves this and this and this actors, uh, and this is how we collaborate across border. In terms of transfer, in transfer for, uh, of children, it might uh, build on the existing system. It might build other paths uh, for safer and legal routes. Um, but it's also very crucial to have those in place for information sharing, as you mentioned. For example, to continue a care plan or to make sure that, yeah, both member states have uh, full information on the child's case with the firewall in place, obviously. I hope that answers the question. I don't know, Flora, if you have any other input on that. No, no, that absolutely answered it. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions. I think that's it. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, joining us today. We really appreciate it. Yes, also on my behalf, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you both Laura and Tore for a really interesting uh, presentation and really practical presentation. I believe a lot of people will be now inspired to um, read the paper and actually co-sign it and your emails are on the screen. So uh, for others, please feel free to get in touch with uh, Laura, uh, Laura and Lore for, um, in this uh, regard. Uh, thank you all once again. And uh, just a quick note that, as usual, um, you can receive a, a, certificate, a certificate for attending our webinar today. All you have to do is write us here on this uh, email that you can see uh, now in the chat. So please just let us know that you attended the webinar and you would like to receive a certificate. Uh, finally, just before you tune off, please uh, uh, fill in the polls we have for you. And other than that, I think we have shared everything we have for today. Thank you, Katarina, and thank you, everyone. Thank you all very much and wish you a great afternoon and a great uh, upcoming weekend. It's coming soon. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.